Under the terms of the Constitution, the Supreme Court was established, but the number of justices and the other details were left to Congress. The Congress established the court system when it passed the Judiciary Act. The Act established the Supreme Court and three circuit courts. Each state had its own federal court and judges, and the circuit courts were staffed with two Supreme Court justices and a local judge who would have to ride around in the circuit in order to hear cases. Washington appointed the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court met for the first time in New York on February 4, 1790. In 1793, President Washington requested the advice of the Supreme Court as to the constitutionality of a number of steps that he intended to take. The justices unanimously refused claiming that the Constitution only gave them power to act once there was a dispute between parties. One of the first cases to reach the Supreme Court was the decision of Chisholm v. Georgia. In that decision, the Supreme Court ruled that a citizen of another state could sue that state. The decision aroused such an outcry that the Eleventh Amendment of the Constitution was passed, which eliminated the ability of a citizen of another state or foreign country to sue in federal court. After Jay served as negotiator to England, he resigned the court to become New York governor. President Washington then nominated John Rutledge to chief justice. But rumor had it that Rutledge was losing his mind and the Senate turned down the nomination. Oliver Ellsworth was then nominated and the Senate confirmed the nomination. Under Ellsworth, the Supreme Court decided the carriage case tax. The Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the law, making this the first case the court upheld the constitutionality of a law. The Supreme Court refused to rule that alien and sedition laws were unconstitutional. In the last moments of the Adams administration, Adams nominated John Marshall to be Chief Justice, and the Senate confirmed the nomination. Early in the Jefferson administration, Marshall issued the decision in Marbury v. Madison. In this brilliant decision, Marshall managed simultaneously to scold the Jefferson administration for not obeying the law, but most importantly, the decision struck down parts of the Judiciary Act as being unconstitutional. Thus, Marshall was able to establish the supremacy of the Supreme Court in deciding the constitutionality of laws passed by Congress. The Jefferson administration and their Republican supporters responded by a concerted attack on the court, including the impeachment of a federal judge in New Hampshire. The Republicans then went after Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase. After a fair trial, presided over by Vice President Burr, the Senate failed to convict Justice Chase, and that was the end of the Republican attack on the court. Chief Justice Marshall went on to establish some of the most important principles of American Constitution. He established the principle that the Commerce Clause of the Constitution related to more than just the buying and selling of goods. He secured the principle that the Supreme Court could declare state law unconstitutional and that states had to obey the Supreme Court and that an individual who lost a case in the highest state court could appeal to the Supreme Court. John Marshall held the office of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court for 34 years, the longest of any Supreme Court justice in history. Marshall was followed as Chief Justice by Roger Taney. Taney served for 29 years, second in length only to Marshall. Taney consolidated many of the decisions of Marshall on the power of the courts. Taney, however, has not gone down in history for his long service on the courts, but rather for his central role in the ill-advised decision in the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott was a slave whose owner had taken him to Illinois, which was a free state. Based on that, he sued for his freedom. When the case arrived at the Supreme Court, Taney could have decided it on narrow grounds. However, he decided to issue a sweeping ruling that stated that the Constitution guaranteed slavery, and thus any action such as the Missouri Compromise to limit slavery was not constitutional. The Dred Scott ruling helped fuel the winds of war. 
The decision, taken to its full meaning, meant that slavery could not be outlawed in any states, including northern free states. This resulted in renewed anti-slavery vigor in the North. The Supreme Court stayed out of most controversies during the Civil War. Wars were not the best time for the rule of law. A few days after the war ended, however, the court handed down a decision in the case of a northern supporter of the South who organized a plot to overthrow the governments of a number of northern states. One of the plotters, Lambin Milligan, was tried in military courts and sentenced to death. He appealed to the Supreme Court, who ordered him released, stating that military courts had no jurisdiction as long as civilian courts were meeting. The 14th Amendment included a provision that stated that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. The first interpretation of the amendment was made by the court in the Slaughterhouse case. In that case, the Supreme Court, by a narrow majority, held that the 14th Amendment did not in fact extend the provisions of the Bill of Rights to actions taken by states. In the latter part of the 19th century, the court took the position that in a series of decisions known as the civil rights cases, there was little that the courts were going to do to enforce the post-Civil War civil rights laws. The most famous being the case of Plessy v. Ferguson, in which the court approved separate but equal, thus giving its okay to Jim Crow laws. In addition, the court struck down a number of rules that regulate business. During this period, the court sympathized with the concept of laissez-faire, that nothing should interfere with business. In 1918, the court upheld the conviction of someone handing out leaflets, calling for young people not to register for the draft. Justice Holmes, writing for the court, stated that there were limits to free speech. In one of the most well-known utterance on the matter, Justice Holmes stated, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect man who falsely shouts fire in a crowded theater, causing panic. In 1925, the court for the first time, in the case of Gitlow v. New York, extended the Bill of Rights to cover the actions of the states. Slowly, over the next decades, all rights enumerated in the Bill of Rights were extended to cover the actions of states. By this time, the court was a distinctly conservative institution, with Chief Justice Taft, the former president, ensuring that all appointments were extremely conservative. The majority of justices believed that the most important task of the court was to upheld property rights. Justice Holmes and Brandeis were constantly trying to extend the roles of government to protect the more powerless in the society. Despite their disagreements, the justices could agree on a number of important items regarding the court itself. First, they convinced Congress that the court needed its own building instead of the chambers that had been in Congress. Congress agreed and allocated the funds to build the Supreme Court building. Second, in 1925, a new Judiciary Act was passed. One of the key provisions of the law was limiting those cases that the Supreme Court had to review to those that the court agreed to review. With the advent of the New Deal, the Supreme Court found itself out of step with the Roosevelt administration and the will of most of the nation. The conservative court found a number of Roosevelt's actions unconstitutional. In the first case, Schechter v. United States, they declared the NRA unconstitutional. This was but the first of many New Deal legislations that the court overturned. Roosevelt responded, after his own overwhelming re-election, by suggesting a reorganization of the court to increase its size so that he could appoint enough new members to change the balance of the court. There was a firestorm of criticism to Roosevelt's plan, but it looked like Roosevelt would be able to pass the plan. But in the last moment, the court decided, by a narrow majority, to upheld the constitutionality of the National Labor Relations Act. Thus, by showing that it could uphold important parts of the New Deal, Roosevelt's movement to pack the court came to an end. Of course, 
By becoming the longest sitting president, Roosevelt ensured eventually that the court would be filled with appointees that agreed with him. By Roosevelt's death, he had appointed eight out of nine Supreme Court justices. During World War II, there were a number of important decisions of the court. In the case of West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, the court declared that individuals could not be forced to salute the flag if it went against their religion. When Japanese Americans sued against their forced relocation, the court turned down their appeal. During the Korean War, President Truman ordered the seizure of the steel mills to prevent a strike. Joan and Laughlin Steel Company sued, and the Supreme Court decided that President Truman had exceeded his powers and could not claim inherent war powers in this case. In 1953, President Eisenhower appointed Earl Warren as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Eisenhower later remarked that the Warren appointment was one of the greatest mistakes of his presidency. Warren turned out to be a committed fighter for civil rights and one of the most activist judges in history. He helped shepherd the landmark Brown v. Board of Education in May of 1954, which overturned the concept of separate but equal for blacks and whites. The Warren Court extended the Commerce Clause to uphold most of the federal civil rights legislation. The Warren Court also ordered any state apportionment that did not abide by the concept of one person, one vote, invalid. The Warren Court also extended other rights. One of the most famous was the case of Miranda v. Arizona. In that case, it stated that an accused must be made aware of his or her rights to have an attorney present, even when being questioned. Thus was born the term Mirandized. President Nixon appointed Justice Berger to replace Warren. Berger was expected to be a much more conservative judge than Warren, but much to Nixon's chagrin, the court under Berger ruled against Nixon in the case of the Pentagon Papers. It also ruled, in the case of Roe v. Wade, that a woman's right to an abortion was protected by the Constitution. The court also ordered President Nixon to turn over his tapes during the special investigation into White House action regarding the Watergate break-in. The court denied Nixon's claim that executive privilege shielded him. Berger was replaced by Chief Justice Rehnquist, and since that time, the court has been closely split between liberals and conservatives. On issues like abortion, affirmative action, and state rights, each Supreme Court decision has been decided by a narrow margin. Despite the narrow margin, today, over 200 years after the decision in Marbury v. Madison, the Supreme Court is still considered the final arbiter of American democracy.